This is the Volvo Ocean Race, the story of a 45-year obsession. Sailing's iconic race around the world, the ultimate test of a team, and the place where elite sport meets human adventure. Achieving victory will mean dominating a 45,000 nautical mile race over 11 legs, taking in 12 host cities across six continents. Seven international teams are vying to add their name to the Volvo Ocean Race trophy. Leg seven saw Mafre finish fifth, their worst result in the race so far. This coupled with a second place by Dongfeng race team saw the Spanish powerhouse drop off the top of the overall leaderboard. The Chinese team now owned the top spot by just one point. The arch rivals now locked head to head. Team Brunel's victory in the leg saw them catapulted from sixth to third in the overall standings. A whole new power struggle had surfaced. With just four legs to the finish, the race was now wide open. We have a problem in the boat because the boat shut down. Tough situation for ourselves, having led for about the last week. All about speed, mate. It's gonna be tight. You gonna make it or you gonna die? I think I'm gonna make it. Just gonna have to keep the bow down and let it rip. We're not gonna lie. Leg 7 proved to be one of the most relentless Southern Ocean passages in the history of the race. But above all, it will be remembered for the devastating loss of Sun Hunkai Scallywag's crew member, John Fisher, who was knocked overboard and sadly not recovered. Once we got that news, unfortunately it was really hard uh, for me uh, personally, but for everybody on board uh, to focus. You know, it was, at, it was at the front of everybody's Everybody's mind, you know, every time you clip in, you think about it, every time the boat's careening down a wave. It's difficult, I mean, it's all, it's all anyone could think about. I could feel the tension that uh, these guys must have felt at that moment, you know? It's a raw panic that you have to uh, put open everything in your capability to solve the situation and find your crewmate back. To go and say to my guys, you know, the news is it was fish that lost his life and they haven't found him and they stopped looking. People were quite reflective or kind of introverted for the day. They all needed their time and their space to deal with it. I had had lots of correspondence on all the legs with Scallywag on email, so I knew I needed to send an email, but you don't really know what to say. So I just sent our team's condolences and sympathies. Um, Willie came straight back. And he just said that, you know, he was his best mate and to make that decision to stop looking is the hardest thing he's ever had to do. For all the skippers and crews, John Fisher would be at the forefront of their minds for the rest of the race. Leg eight would be the last long leg in the race. The Southern Ocean was now over, but new challenges would lay ahead as they pushed north. First eight to nine days will be a big tactical game. And then we turn left, just past Bermuda, and then in, you have in the hands of the weather gods. Once you get north of the Gulf Stream, you know, cold water, cold seas, it can be some pretty vicious storms. And then just before you get into Newport, it's freezing. You get quite foggy conditions. It can be quite wet and windy and wild. So it's a, a crazy leg. A lot of boats are gonna be up there to win the leg. And for us, from Mafre, we have to step up again and put all the strength to try to win this leg. There's still a lot to go for and to win and to earn. And I think every team will feel that tension and every team will fight to cope with it best. It's about managing the pressure we have. Probably it's our best opportunity to win the race. If you have a very good result in the next one, then all of a sudden the lead is really inside of grabbing. We want nothing more than to, to win and do our home stopover. In the run-up to the start in Idijai, it was a race against the clock for both Sun Hunkai Scallywag and Vestas 11th Hour Racing, who both retired from the previous leg. Both teams having to have their boats delivered in time to repair and refit before the next start. Vestas 11th Hour Racing having a new mast fitted after losing theirs in the South Atlantic. It was no small feat to just get the boat here, you know, from the Falkland Islands on delivery with a jury rig, with the diesel tanks, with the charter flight, delivery crew, technicians. I mean, it's been 
you know, an act of Congress, you know, just to get us to a point where we can start this leg on time. From a sailing team standpoint, we're very excited, you know, for that to be the case. You know, we're hungry to get back on the water. Sun Hunkai Scallywag had just three days to prepare their boat before the start of leg eight. But the Volvo Ocean Race family came together to make sure it happened. For David Witt's team, it was far more than a physical presence that was admirable as the team aimed to be on the start line. It was the mental strength and fortitude that shone through in Scallywag's close-knit crew. The support we've had from, you know, within the Volvo family has been amazing. I think, you know, it takes a special people to do this race, whether you're the skipper or you're the crew, and I think the character of the people in this race has been amplified by the way we've been supported by other competitors in the last week. There's a whole lot of sort of an ethos that the Scallywags try and live by, you know, you know, we never give up, we look after each other, we don't have to be the best, but we do it together, and, and probably the most important moral of our team is loyalty, and I, you know, obviously I've had a lot of time to think about it in the last 10 days, but I'm pretty much describing John Fisher. You know, if he was standing behind me right now, he'd be telling me to harden up, don't be soft and get on with it, and that's what we're going to do on Sunday. Come race day, it was an emotive docking out for all the teams as they headed out to the start of the leg. Poignant goodbyes, reflective moments. First time I'm ever going to start a yacht race in 12 years without fish, so I keep looking around, seeing where he is, and remind myself he's not here. But you know, we got his logo on the mainsail and on the boat and on our shirts, and he's, he's with us. And I'm sure he will do all he can from where he is up there to help us get a good result in this leg. All the crews were positive in their approach to continue their part in one of the toughest team sports in the world. 5,700 nautical miles from Itaji in Brazil to Newport, Rhode Island. It's go for the entire fleet. Brunel coming in hot on starboard. Look how close it is. The fleet will race north for 5,700 miles up through the Atlantic Ocean and cross the equator for the last time, negotiating the ever tricky doldrums before heading to the finish line in the US sailing Mecca, Newport, Rhode Island. All the boats headed east from the Brazilian coast into tricky and unpredictable weather conditions that immediately tested the skill of the sailors. For the first 24 hours, there were multiple lead changes, but soon it was overall race leader, the Chinese Dongfeng race team, who set the pace at the front. Doing a pretty good job at the moment, actually. It's, uh, everyone else is back there, so I don't mind if it's upwind as long as everyone's behind us. We have Tom Feng just in our bow, 1.5 miles away, and then we have the rest of the fleet, two miles or more than two miles behind us, so we are quite happy. The speed of the boat is key in this kind of legs, no? because all the boats, we are close to each other, and you want to gain meter by meter. We have to keep focus if we want to win this leg. As the fleet zigzagged their way northeast, this leg was already proving to be about marginal gains. But with an ever-changing breeze and cloud systems, it was proving to be a huge strategic challenge. Had quite a lot of cloud activity, so obviously the clouds are sucking and blowing, so when you're on the edges of them, the wind's doing very different things, so it's really up and down. Kind of position yourself with the clouds to try and get the best out of them. Well, the uh, difficulties of tonight are basically right on the crossover between two of our sails. One is the Masthead Zero and then to the uh, J1, which is more of your normal type of jib. The problem is we've been sailing in and out of the crossover all sort of afternoon and into this evening. And the problem with that is if you take the time to do the change from one sail to the other, you need to evaluate how much you're going to lose doing the change versus how much you're going to gain. As all the teams approached an oil field exclusion zone 100 miles off Rio de Janeiro's coastline, Turn the Tide on Plastic and Vestas 11th Hour Racing, who were the most easterly boats, edged into the lead. Axo was 193.19, Grinnell 189, just under 20. 
We had some big clouds yesterday and most of the fleet ended up on the uh, left of the cloud. We sort of got ourselves positioned to the right of the cloud. Actually, Gongfeng got to the right, but we just pushed on a bit further together to turn the tide and the boats on the left hit, hit worse current and then had to tack off a bad shift to clear the exclusion zone, which has allowed us to uh, turn the tide to sort of slip through ahead. I think we're winning at the moment, so that's pretty cool. We've got Vestas about five miles behind us there. We've got Dongfeng we can see about eight miles directly downwind of us. Di Kafari and her team had proved in the last leg they had matured into a force to be reckoned with, beating Mafre, one of the race favourites. Of the seven teams, Turn the Tide on Plastic has the least experienced offshore crew, and when Kafari was recruiting, she needed some key figures to support her. Liz Wardley was her first signing, and with extensive knowledge gained from two previous campaigns, Wardley has been instrumental in the way the team operates. There isn't anybody that knows these boats better, every inch of these boats. And there isn't anybody that, no matter what the conditions, will always fix whatever's broken. And she also has it in her, the drive, all the time to send it at 100%. It's the closest racing you can find in offshore sailing. And it's extreme, it's relentless, it's, the competition's fierce, and it's pretty much everything that, that I love. I guess being the boat captain, you're kind of responsible for, for keeping it all together, really. And I guess one of the benefits we had when we started up our team is that I knew the boat so well, so that the, the guys that were coming into the team could concentrate on learning how to race the boat as opposed to learning how to maintain the boat. So I think that was a big plus for us. She's very confident in all weather conditions and has pretty much seen and done everything. So nothing really phases her. And that's really important for me, having a young crew, to see that kind of confidence in somebody. So that was really important for me to have that so that they could grow up thinking everything was okay and it would be fine and they develop the similar skills. I guess you're just trying to pass on experience um, and bridge the experience gap that some of our guys had. But uh, at the same time, I think they've taught us a lot as well. Over the next two days, Turn the Tide on Plastic and Vestas 11th Hour Racing swapped places at taking the lead, but by now were not alone. Their duel soon became a four-way battle, with Team Brunel and Dongfeng Race Team closing in fast. It's been a pretty interesting last 12 hours, really. We uh, started off quite a long way behind Vestas, and then following them, slightly gaining. We should be right behind them. Dongfeng's just jibe, so we're going to match just to sort of cover our a little bit, get into the coast, just over here, just try and stay on the inside of them, just protect our position at the moment. One. Two, back. We're nearing the top eastern corner of Brazil. This sort of next few days we need to make a call how close we stay to the coast and how much driving we do around the corner or whether we just go straight after the corner. Deciding that is then what sets you up going further north. During much of the race over the previous seven legs, Dongfeng race team were used to a familiar sight, their arch rivals, Mafre. The two teams often together and covering each other's every move but a week into the leg, the Spanish team were back in sixth position and had issues. We have a problem in the boat because the boat shut down completely. The main fuses blow away and a couple more as well. And then the uh, consequence of that was a few instruments just broke and a few more things. But uh, right now the, the bigger problem we're trying to solve is uh, we cannot control the kill, not with the electric or the main engine. So. I don't know, we try to make some bridges and try to open the valves manually and see if it works. With the movement of the keel essential to be able to race the boat efficiently, the crew made a bypass switch, but it would have to be hand operated below deck. For Mafre, this was a disadvantage they could do without in his all important leg. As the Volvo Ocean Race fleet crossed the equator into the northern hemisphere for the last time in the race, sea temperatures rose and with it a natural hazard to the boats. Sargassum seaweed and it was in abundance. For us it's a real problem because it gets stuck in all our foils, it gets stuck in the rudder and the keel on the dagger boards when we're using them and sometimes it gets such a big clump that you can't even steer the boat and we end up wiping out. It's a problem we're going to end up dealing with for another couple days. I guess the whole fleet's going to have to deal with it, so it's just part of racing in this part of the world. It was common knowledge amongst the competitors that the northeast trade winds would be critical for success. Team Brunel were first to take advantage of the new breeze and went into a commanding lead. 
got Dong Feng and Vestas and turn the side close behind us, so we're trying to get every mile that we can ahead of them. Just trying to get the boat going as fast as possible, so every two hours we put a new driver on. We're constantly monitoring the, the performance data, so if anybody's doing something incorrectly, we know to make a change, change the driver or the crib or the setup to, um, to kind of get the performance going at its optimum at all times. As Team Brunel made gains, Turn the Tide on Plastic dropped back into fourth spot. A bitter pill to swallow after a solid performance earlier in the leg. The first four boats are all within 35 miles of each other, so the pressure's on. We've just lost our podium spot and we're in fourth place again. So we're a bit frustrated, but we've got time and we are determined. By now, Sunhunkai Skellywag were more than 200 miles behind the leaders and last, but stoic in their attitude. As much as a, a realist I am, and I think it's going to be hard for us to um, really overtake someone, I think we'll get back in touch with the police. You can really never say never. The Scallywags were a tight-knit crew with a simple ethos. Antonio Fontes had joined a shore crew, but was quickly racing at sea, a dream for the Portuguese sailor. It's very nice to be part of this Scallywag group. It's kind of a different team. We are all kind of the same level, like trying to learn and trying to learn with each other along the way and making the most out of the experience and not trying to be better than anyone else on board. Just beat the other boats, but not inside the boat. So, yeah, I think it's, it's a good environment that uh, David Witt created. Professional sailing in Portugal is very small and obviously I have been fighting to be here for a long time but I hope this time around with me and uh, the other two Portuguese and uh, Planet Island Plastic I think we will inspire a future generation to have more professional sailors in Portugal and more offshore sailors as well. All the teams drag race their way north. Positions didn't change for days but as the pressure dropped the fleet compressed. Team Brunel's first place advantage was being eaten away by the hour, and there was a surprise contender to the leading boats. Dumpfer racing team, going 40, range 11 miles. My friend, is us. Third. We are only 10 miles uh, behind Brunel, and three miles behind Dumpfer. This opens a little bit the, the game again for us, and anything can happen. 24 hours uh, ago, we were fifth and suddenly we, we're here on the fight. Mafre had made an incredible comeback and passed both Vestas 11th Hour Racing and turned the tide on plastic as they approached the finish line in Newport, Rhode Island. Their arch rivals Dongfong race team also showed their strength and were able to overhaul Team Brunel. Bit of a tough situation I suppose for ourselves having led for about the last week going into a big compression here which uh, we always kind of knew was going to happen at the end of the race. Everyone's super close and uh, you know, it seems a lot of boats behind are just uh, slowly gaining. We think we can win but regarding what is ahead of us. Uh, we know uh, it can be easy if the wind stay. It can be a big mess and a big change of the, in the ranking if the wind drop and you have gusts everywhere. It's in the night, fog, so we don't, cannot see a lot. Team Brunel was not giving up easily. For more than an hour, in a shifty light breeze, the two boats traded first place for second, and with Mafre now in the mix, the battle was truly on for the top spot. The three boats were now just a couple of miles apart and heading to the finish in a surreal slow motion battle in the coastal fog. The last two hours have been uh, very close, very light racing against Dong Feng and Mafre. We managed to uh, get the better breeze and squeeze out ahead. Now we're close to the finish, I think. For the Chinese team, the tension was unbearable as Team Brunel slipped ahead as the lack of wind and an outgoing tide made progress impossible. Yeah, yeah. which way is the finish? Somewhere over there? And things only got worse for them. Their nemesis, Mafre, jumped to second place with just two miles to the finish. Looks like a smaller sail though, right? Ready for the master, guys. As Brunel closed in on the finish line, Mafre steadily but surely closed in on them. After nearly 5,700 miles, it was coming down to the line with just meters separating the two boats. Tortuous for both the crews in the virtually windless end of their leg. All about speed, mate. Yes. Just one mile further behind, another duel was playing out. Dongfong race team, who had led into the approach to Newport, had dropped back further. 
unthinkable for the overall leaders of the race. We are first. And now we are fourth. Fourth. Behind Vestas. That is third. Mafre second and Brunel uh, first. But no, nothing is uh, nothing is done. Nothing is done. At the last passing mark, the battle between Mafre and Team Brunel was finally coming to a conclusion. It's gonna be tight. Keep accelerating. All about build from here. Yes. I'm coming forward up a bit now, okay? Only chance we got is to get him on starboard. You gonna make it or you gonna attack? I think I'm gonna make it. Mafre had made an astonishing comeback. 300 miles from Newport, they were fifth. Now they were inching their way in front of Bauer Becking's team in the last few hundred meters. Stand by, not in here. Go! Just one minute separated them after 16 days of racing. The Spanish crew could hardly believe it themselves as they took the win. A second spot for the Dutch team, albeit respectable, was difficult to swallow after they'd led for most of the past week. The last 24 hours has been just fighting every meter, every ball length, every wave, and uh, you know we've been this morning in position of not only catching up uh, Don Fenn, which was our goal, but catching uh, Brunel as well in the last meters and win the leg. So couldn't go any better for us, and uh, we are super happy. Yeah, result is uh, is maybe not what we have to hope for, but uh, yeah, second place, and especially if you get the past in the last uh, point three of a mile before the finish, that's really sour. But sailing can be sometimes really cruel. Of course, got it right now, feeling, but that's uh, how it goes. The next boat to come out of the fog to claim third spot was a welcome sight for the local fans at the Fort Adams Race Village. Vestas 11th Hour Racing scored their first point in five legs. You know, when we sail, we sail pretty well. <laughs> so it's nice to score some points in 2018, certainly, and get a podium here into our hometown. So yeah, a lot of emotion, but uh, all good at this stage. A fourth place for Dongfeng race team was the cruelest blow for Charles Cordrelia and his Chinese team. Honestly, when we were 2.5 miles ahead of Brunel, uh, at 18 miles of the finishing line, we were starting to dream about the best, but we knew it would be complicated to finish, but not as much as it has been. And the pain wasn't over for the remaining three boats racing. Fifth across the line was Team Axenobel, who passed Turn the Tide on Plastic within sight of the finish. There was no hiding Di Kafari's disappointment. Her team had led for several days of the race, only to drop back in the concluding chapter of this leg. Despite Sunumkai Scallywag's huge gains in the last 24 hours, they simply ran out of time to improve on their last position. But skipper David Witt was positive upon arrival. The last thing really that's important for us was the result. It was very important for us to get back in the race after the tragedy and, and uh, all stay together. And, you know, I think we probably sailed the best we have in the whole race and got the worst result, but um, we're glad to be back in the race. With a surprise leg victory by Mafre, the Spanish team have now regained the overall lead from Dongfeng race team and are three points clear. Team Brunel remains in third spot. There was now time for all the crews to rest and recuperate in Newport, Rhode Island before leg nine. Next up, the fleet head back to Europe, a 3,300 nautical mile transatlantic sprint to Cardiff in Wales. It will be the last double points leg, which could be the defining moment to who wins this edition of the Volvo Ocean Race. <laughs>